country of the world, there is screening for preeclampsia. And the question is whether that is sufficiently good or whether we need to improve on that method. So the method of screening that exists in at least all developed uh, countries is summarized in this uh, slide. In the left, on the left, we have the NICE guidelines in England, and on the right, the guidelines from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And, they, and, and, and the two are just the same, with minor differences. Um, women are asked when they first are seen in the hospital by their obstetrician, by their midwife, whether they had a previous uh, preeclampsia, uh, whether they suffer from kidney disease, chronic hypertension, diabetes, or autoimmune disease like uh, lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome. And if they say yes, then they are classified as being at high risk. Then they are asked a few more questions, and if they say yes to two of the following questions, then they're also classified as being at high risk. The following questions are first pregnancy. In England, if you are more than 40, in America, because medical care is private, they need to improve the income of the obstetricians, so you have to be 35. In England, if you are a body mass index of more than 35, in America, because the population is extremely thin, uh, they have to have a body mass index of more than 30. The pregnancy interval between the last and the present pregnancy lasts more than 10 years. If you have a family history of preeclampsia, and in America, if you are black or poor, which often is the same thing. So the question is, the existing method of screening, how good is it? Because it's very cheap. You just need to ask a few questions, and then you tell the people you're high risk, and then you prescribe aspirin. Is it good? Well, neither NICE guidelines, nor the Royal College of Obstetricians, nor the American College of Obstetricians, or the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine ever bothered to investigate. Usually people that write guidelines sit at home, think about it, discuss it with a few friends, and then they say, these are the guidelines. They don't need to justify to anybody how good the guidelines are, because they are important people that write them. Well, we investigated how good they are, and they are simple, they're cheap, and they're very bad. The detection rate of preeclampsia is 40%, and they classify it as being at high risk 10% of the population. And in an era where a lot of energy is apparently devoted to this concept or misconception of personalized medicine, you don't get a personalized risk. You're classified as being at high or no risk. Over a period of 40 years, sometimes in research it takes 40 years to develop something, we develop the method, a new method. And that method combines the information from the history, but not in a sort of arbitrary way. It uses a multiple regression analysis to give individualized risk based on your age, not old, young, on your weight, not obese, thin, on your race. The women that are black or South Asian in racial origin, they have a higher risk than white women. If you had a previous pregnancy with preeclampsia, if your mother had preeclampsia, if you conceived by in vitro fertilization, or again, you start your pregnancy with chronic hypertension, diabetes, or autoimmune disease. And by using a multiple regression analysis, rather than arbitrary one, two, three, four, five to 10, then you take into account the interrelationship between the various uh, components of the medical characteristics of, and medical history. And that gives you the starting risk. Statisticians call it prior risk. And then you measure various things. Well, if the condition that you're screening for is called preeclampsia, 
and preeclampsia is a disease of high blood pressure, I suppose it's easy to measure the blood pressure. And indeed, we found that this is useful over a series of many studies involving 60,000 prospectively examined pe pregnancies, that the blood pressure at 12 weeks in women that will subsequently develop preeclampsia is higher than in those that will not develop preeclampsia. And then I think that in at least most uh, advanced countries, and I consider Ukraine to be one of those, uh, women have a 12-week scan for the measurement of nuclear translucency. Well, I don't think that you can buy an ultrasound machine nowadays without color Doppler. And if you know where the uterus is and the baby, then surely you know where the cervix is. And on either side of the cervix, there are two vessels, and they're called the uterine arteries that you can see pulsating with color Doppler. And you can just put a pulse on it and get a pulsability index. And then when you send off a blood sample to measure PAB-A and free beta HCG for the calculation of risk for Downs, you can use the same blood sample to also measure placental uh, growth factor. And I will discuss that um, in relation to whether you measure that or PLG of or PAB. -A. And then you combine this uh, data, the history and the three biomarkers and then you develop a, a prediction model. And this model predicts that at 12 weeks, we can identify about 90% of the women that will develop preeclampsia uh, before 32 weeks, 75 before 37, and about 40 to 45 of preeclampsia at term. And we did this study in 35,000 women, and then we used two independent, uh, prospectively collected data sets to validate the model, and it was more or less true. Um, one of the studies for validation, uh, one of the very few that were funded in my career um, by, the, uh, by the system, uh, involved examination of women in 16 uh, national health system uh, hospitals in England uh, involving um, so 16,007 such sorts of hospitals involving 16 and a half thousand uh, women. And then these women were coming for a scan at 12 weeks for Downs. We recorded the medical history and whether they take any medications such as aspirin. And we measured the blood pressure, the Doppler, the PLGF and the PABE. And then we obtained the pregnancy outcome all of the data were transferred to an independent body so that we could not cheat if we wanted to. And then the data were in an anonymous way uh, without any outcome transferred to a statistician who calculated the risks. And then the data were merged in this independent body and we got some results. And these are the results. Uh, the red is the history-based model that is used already, uh, and the blue are uh, the new method. And it, you can see that for preeclampsia before 34, 37, and after 37, the new method um, was twice as good for the same screen positive rate as uh, that unified the two, the two techniques. So, <laughs> I think that this is, this is the evidence. And what does it say, this evidence? Well, it says that if a woman comes, in any case, to be seen at 12 weeks, and I think that all women deserve to have a look at their baby at 12 weeks to see whether it's alive or dead, to see if it's one or two, to see if it has a head or not, uh, and to more or less see whether it is normal or not, and in this visit, we asked them a few questions. And then in pregnancy, whenever we see a woman, we measure their blood pressure. And then we measure the pub A because we do so in any, in any case to assess the risk for downs. And if we have three pounds extra, translate that in your language, um, then we can also measure placental growth factor. And the only real difficulty 
which is not a difficulty, it's a difficulty in the mind of those that have a blocked mind, is whether you spend a few seconds to look at the uterine artery pulsatility index. Of course, the people that wake up in the morning and go to sleep feeling depressed, they say this is very difficult. But for people that don't feel so depressed about life, the people that do the ultrasound scans know how to measure the Dopplers because they have to measure the Dopplers for certain specific conditions. So if they're allowed to spend literally a few seconds more, and if we spend some time to train them to make sure that they measure things properly, this method can be implemented. What could possibly be the objective, objection to doing so if we compare the blue and the red without even looking at the numbers? Now, I will now address some more specific uh, uh, questions. One question is that should we spend those three pounds more to measure PLGF or should we just rely on the pave that we have anyway? Yeah? It depends on what you do with the results. If as a consequence of classifying somebody as being high risk, you just need to give them aspirin, and in most people this is not harmful, then you can afford to only measure PABE and tolerate that the screen positive rate will be about 5% higher than if you measure PLGF. So you may say, well, I'll just give a few more people uh, aspirin and don't bother uh, spending the three pounds on the measurement of PLGF. Uh, the results below are from 60, 6, 0, 0, 0, 0, 000 pregnancies that show that if we measure PABE, we are improving the prediction achieved by history alone by about five points. But if we measure PLGF instead, we improve it by 15 points. If we measure PLGF, then it's not useful to also measure PABE. And if we measure the blood pressure and Doppler, again, it is not useful to measure PABE. In contrast, if by measuring PLGF, you can get a further improvement. So that is the conclusion. Either just measure PABE because you measure it already and tolerate a higher screen positive rate or switch to PLGF. The next question is, in which country do you live? If you live in Ghana, most of the people are black. And if you live in Ukraine, most of the people are white. So when you use a screening method developed in a specific group of hospitals, the cutoff used to achieve a certain detection rate and a certain screen positive or false positive rate depends on the characteristics of the population that you included in your study. In our studies, mainly around King's College Hospital and Medway Hospital, King's College Hospital has about 20% of the people are black. Um, then the cutoff that corresponds to a screen positive rate of about 10% is one in a hundred. So this is the number that we have used in our subsequent studies for uh, prevention of preeclampsia by aspirin. However, if I'm living in Ukraine, where the population is predominantly white, I would go for a cutoff of about one in 150, which would give you a detection rate of preterm preeclampsia of about 80% and tolerate a screen positive rate of about 15, 16%. If you live in England with a heterogeneous population, you cannot do that. Because if you did that, you can't 
apply different cutoffs for different racial origins, it will become very uh, psychologically unstabling for the government and the institutions to do so. Then you, you need to use the same cutoff. But if we use the same cutoff of one in 150, for our black women, the performance of screening would be quite different than in our white women. The detection rate would be 95% with a screen positive rate of 43%. Why? Well, because the chances that a black woman will develop preeclampsia are three times higher than the chances that a white woman will develop preeclampsia. Now, there's another thing that we can do in screening, manipulate the results in a condition called contingent screening. What does this mean? Well, if we screen everybody with history, blood pressure, Doppler, and PLGF, we have a detection rate of 90% and for preeclampsia for 32 weeks and 75% for preeclampsia for 37 weeks. Can we achieve the same thing without doing everything on everybody and save some money? The answer is, of course, we can. Because if we take a whole population, some women, based on their history alone, will be so high of a risk that whatever the measurements are that you take of the biomarkers, they will still remain high risk. And the same is true for another proportion of the population that they are so very, very low risk that whatever the results of the biomarkers are, they will remain low risk. And this is illustrated here. Let me show you what I mean. If the first method of screening for everybody is to ask them a few questions, then we only need to measure blood pressure, Doppler, and PLGF in 70% of the population. If we measure the blood pressure and uterine artery Doppler, we only need to spend those three extra pounds for the measurement of PLGF in 40% of the population. And if you live in a country where three pounds is not a lot, but you have psychological problems and competence problems in measuring Doppler, then you can measure blood pressure and PLGF and you can reserve the measurement of Doppler in 30% of the population. And you can still achieve that desired detection rate of 90% of preeclampsia for 32 weeks and 75 of preeclampsia for 37 weeks. Now, let me move on to the clinical implementation. In 1992, when we described the measurement of nuchal translucency for uh, assessment of risk for Down syndrome, we had to go through a process of defining the criteria of measuring nuclear translucency. It is not something that you automatically know how to do because you were born a doctor. You need to be trained to get the right images, learn how the baby looks like, and know where to measure and how to measure. Well, the same is true, of course, with everything. It's just that for the vast majority of things that we do in medicine, there are no standards. There are no criteria. There is no method of auditing. I have never been asked to show how to measure blood pressure uh, and to show my measurements to confirm that I am doing the right thing. Then I spend my whole life doing some wrong measurements and giving some wrong drugs to the wrong patients. And yet, in the case of nuclear translucency, we imposed a method of training and certification and yearly audit of the results. Well, the same must be true for the measurement of uterine artery Doppler, and there are specific criteria and have been published many times. The same is true with blood pressure. I was not told when I was a, a medical student that I have to put the cuff on the left or the right arm. I think usually they told us to just put it on the left. I was not told how long I have to wait before I measure the blood pressure of the patient. 
I was not told that patients are scared of doctors and therefore when you measure their blood pressure, it is higher than what it is because we scare them. I was not told that I have to find a, a bench in the hospital to support the arm of the patient at the level of the heart. Just, just, just put the cap on and just listen. And if it is, I don't know, poof, 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 then that is the cutoff. Um, well, now there are criteria on how to measure the blood pressure. You have to let the patients rest for a few minutes. They have to be supported with their legs not crossed. You have to find the right size of the calf to put on their arm. You need to measure the blood pressure on both sides because quite often it is different between the two sides. And you must not just measure the first measurement because it's often higher than what it should be. You should take at least two measurements and then take the average of the four uh, between the two arms. So if we are going to implement a new method of screening, because in implementing the previous method of screening, you didn't need criteria. Everybody knew exactly what to do. We were born with that knowledge. When you implement a new method, you have to reassess what it is that people do. You need to accurately record the age of a woman. You cannot ask a woman what is her weight because they, women always lie. They are always 10 kilograms less than what they are. So you must measure their weight and you must calibrate the weighing machine every few months. Otherwise the measurements are wrong. Um, you must uh, weigh them and you must take their height. Um, and the same really with each component of taking a history. Uh, you must find out specifically if a woman had preeclampsia in her previous pregnancy or not, she may only know that she had a high blood pressure or she may have been told that she had preeclampsia, but it was not really preeclampsia. You need to uh, be having the data available, which allows you to assess the different components of the history. And then you must take accurate recording of blood pressure and Dopplers and, 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 and PLGF, and you must audit the results. We need to convert the measurements into multiples of the median. What do you mean by that? Well, the placental growth factor in a normal black woman is completely different than the placental growth factor in a normal white woman. And I don't quite know what is white. Are the whites of my country, Cyprus, the same as the whites of Ukraine? I suspect we look a little bit different and I wouldn't be surprised if we are also biochemically uh, behaving differently. So in each country, I think that in each region almost, you need to be constantly adjusting the measured values uh, for the characteristics of the population that you're measuring. This sounds strange, but a good laboratory has been doing that for the last 50 years in terms of originally screening with alpha fetoprotein and subsequently in the 80s screening for second trimester serum biochemistry for uh, Down syndrome. And then what is an outcome measure? Well, there are all sorts of different definitions of preeclampsia. We have to use perhaps the same definition. And you have to ensure that the diagnosis is correct. Every time I go to the records of my hospital, and I asked the computer to tell me if a woman had preeclampsia. They get the names of the patients. And then I look at the records. Half of the ones that the midwives or the doctors said that preeclampsia are not preeclampsia. And if I then go and look at the women that really got preeclampsia, half of those that did get preeclampsia are not recorded in the hospital outcome notes as having preeclampsia. You have to be a spy. You have to check in different fields if they were taking any antihypertensive drugs have to work out why was this woman induced at 34 weeks for which condition, and then look at the nose and then realize that they had preeclampsia, but in the hospital records, it is not recorded as preeclampsia. So if you're screening for something, you need to know the accuracy of your outcome measures. And then the performance of screening in different populations will depend on the characteristics of that 
population. When we screen for Down syndrome and we tell a lie that with the combined test, the detection rate is about 90% for a screen positive rate of 5%, it is a lie because that is a population statistic and it doesn't apply to any single one woman that we have in front of us. And yet that is what we tell each woman. If the woman is 45 years old, the detection rate is not 90%, it's 99%. And the screen positive rate is about 25%. If the woman in front of us is 20 years old, the detection rate is not 90% of the combined test with a screen positive rate of 5%. No, the detection rate is 75% for a screen positive rate of about 1.5%. So I have already shown you that for the same test, for the same risk cutoff, the detection rate and screen positive rates for a white woman are one third less than in a black woman. And the final thing really in the implementation of screening, in England now every few months, every hospital has to send the results to one mathematician that looks at the results of the biochemical laboratories and they send them a report. And they do exactly the same with the measurements of nuclear translucency for each sonographer that works in this country. And this is what the results look like. They have a distribution, which is these black lines up and down, um, within this pattern of green, yellow, and red. If your measurements are in the green zone, then you are told they are all right. If they're in the yellow zone, they are, you are told you are not all right, but you're not too bad. You better be careful. And if you're in the red zone, you receive a letter that you must stop doing ultrasound scans immediately. Otherwise, the police will arrest you and torture you. Immediately, you must stop scanning, and somebody must investigate what are you doing wrong. You have to be retrained and you have to be allowed in a gradual process to be introduced into being allowed to carry on with doing the nuclear scan. This is exactly what happens in my hospital. Every three months I have a report and two or three of the doctors that work in my unit have to stop scanning the same day and they have to be retrained and we have to investigate for what they were doing wrong. Well, if we are serious about screening, that's exactly what must be happening if we are going to institute screening for preeclampsia. Otherwise, it will be a disaster. The blood pressure needs to be monitored for each individual. If you are a, an auxiliary nurse with no education, you're just told how to measure blood pressure and you do it properly, the blood pressures that you get are low because you wait for five minutes to rest, and you do it properly. If you're a professor of obstetrics and you do the blood pressure, your measurements are always high because you're in a hurry to save lives. So you don't have time to waste five minutes to measure the blood pressure. You just do it very quickly, press the button and write any measurement you feel like done. So it is important that the measurements are recorded properly and the right adjustments are done because in the white people of Cyprus, the blood pressure because of the temperature, because of the of the diet or God knows what else may be different than the blood pressure in Kiev. And the same is true with the uterine artery Doppler. And of course, the same is true with placental growth factor. Now, if you have done all of that, is it worthwhile? And this is really where it comes down to um, the results of the ASPER trial, where we screen using this method 30,000 women and the high risk group were allocated to either aspirin 150 milligrams per day from 12 to 36 weeks or placebo. And that study showed that with aspirin, uh, you reduce the rate of very early preeclampsia. And also, as Jerry mentioned, uh, small for gestational age by about 90%, about 60% the rate of preterm preeclampsia and not very much the rate of temporary cancer. So this is, in a sense, 
what is the reason for screening. And something else really that it was a secondary analysis of our, of, the, of our results, but actually perhaps it was the most important for those that decide how much money to spend on nuclear weapons versus medicine. And that is the length of stay in the neonatal unit. The blue curve comes from the women that received placebo and the red from the women that received aspirin. And you can see that most of the length of stay in the neonatal unit is accounted for babies that are born before 32 weeks. After 32 weeks, you can see the, the, the graph is actually flat in both sides. Because screening in the first trimester identifies 90% of the women that will deliver with preeclampsia before 32 weeks, and aspirin prevents 90% of these births, then inevitably the length of stay in the neonatal unit is dramatically reduced by about 70%. And the cost saving from this is far more than what you need to spend for implementation of the method of screening. I was going to say a lot more, but I think my time has run out and perhaps we should stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kipros, for this brilliant lecture. Three lectures on implementation of new inventions, developments, etc. What we can first learn from it is that we can do so much better than we generally do. And that's the thing that we have to realize. If you measure cervical length incidentally in some patients, there will be no benefit in outcome. And the same will be for screening on early preeclampsia. The same will be on fetal heart rate monitoring during labor. It will not have an effect. It may, will only have an effect if you really do seriously what we are supposed to do. Usually outcome in obstetrics is rather favorable. And I guess that's the reason why doctors are generally so lazy. Well, outcome will, will probably be okay. So why bother? I think the most important lessons from these lectures are, yes, we have to bother. That's the only way to really improve outcome, etc. So, Kipros, how do you think in Ukraine they may well be able to implement early screening? What would convince the politician? What would convince the healthcare provider, providers to set up a system? And what should the doctors do? Jerry, in this unfortunate uh, political climate, between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, it may be wrong of me to talk in favor of Russia, but I was very pleasantly surprised that in Russia, they just implemented first semester screening for preeclampsia. They it had nothing. And then a few years ago, after some meetings with politicians and doctors that were very much into public health doctors and people in genetic disease and so on, they introduced the first trimester combined test for screening for Downs. And this year, they having created the infrastructure for screening for, for, for Downs, they have implemented just like that, screening for um, preeclampsia. So I think that the ability to implement screening for uh, preeclampsia depends on what is the in existing infrastructure in Ukraine for screening for Downs. And I know of some uh, major people, uh, major laboratories that were involved in screening, but I want help uh, in understanding what is the current state at the national level of screening for uh, for downs. But if they have screening for downs and they are doing it properly, and they may or may not do it properly, and I think that England is doing it properly because it has a national program of screening where the results from all sonographers, from all laboratories, every few months are sent to a central body, and there is an infrastructure of how to look at the distributions, the results, 
and an infrastructure of how to uh, implement local changes if the results are not proper, then if you have such an infrastructure, then it is not too difficult uh, to adjust it for screening for preeclampsia without really much cost. If they, if they are already measuring PAVE, for example, they don't need to necessarily measure PLGF. They just tolerate a 5% higher screen positive rate. Basic infrastructure, very important. There is a question from the audience that I read from my telephone. One more comment. Dear Professor Nikolaidis, your lecture can really cause a depression. If such an influential person and society cannot implement such a powerful and important instrument in healthcare system in one of the most progressive countries, UK, maybe it's hopeless. Hopeless. Do you have data? What proportion of pregnant women are being screened for preeclampsia by the Fetal Medicine Foundation method now in the United Kingdom? In other words, how is your home country for this moment doing? One percent. It will take approximately uh, 10 years before it is implemented. And Jerry, you have to uh, give the unfortunate facts about the implementation of uh, uh, your favorite topic of steroids for the prevention of respiratory distress syndrome, the interval between the original research and the clinical implementation. Yes, I have shown that slide in science that it usually takes about 14 years for a very promising method to be introduced. But this time now, finally, in the year 2021, I would hope that we were able to do it a little bit better. But which are the factors that prohibited that? Is it us? Is it our laziness? Is it the fact that we don't have enough contacts with the politicians and with the healthcare officials? In a way, I think it is also us, since we are too lazy to really to do things properly. Um, <laughs> Jerry, uh, yes, uh, Zarko may have uh, some views on that. I think it is our laziness yeah. because Jerry, we can implement things you can do things without politicians and without asking for more money actually and we might even save money zarko i would try to be not as as harsh and try to be more more positive um and i'm I've listened to Kipros carefully, and, and it was fascinating, Kipros, for me to see how much praise you gave um, to NHS, dare I say, in, in the way they run um, combined screening now. And, um, but I also remember vividly your frustration, exasperation, and criticism, fierce criticism, rightly so, for, for the same NHS, for not doing it for years and years and years and years. And you could argue that the same thing is happening with preeclampsia screening, possibly with cervical length screening, uh, implementation of NIPP. And I would try to suggest that maybe these, these people are thinking we'd rather not do it than to do it badly. And I think that our our job, and that, that has been kind of like the, the, the my my light motif of my lecture is to say our job and your job is to continue to push the boundaries, but we need to accept that implementing a screening, whatever, pap screening, breast cancer screening, whatever screening is a skill and cost and uh, 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 know-how that is not our job. It is not, it is not our skill set. And I think we need to accept that there is a partnership and that we need to communicate and that we need to work with people and accept sometimes with our frustration that if these people are saying we are not ready to do it, either because we haven't got the money, we haven't got the resources, because implementing screening for preeclampsia can actually stop doing us screening for domestic violence or God knows what, 
maybe we should just sort of accept it, keep pushing the boundaries, and then say that when it ha- but when it happens, and I have no doubt that it will happen, then it's going to be done properly and it's going to then convincingly do more uh, uh, benefit than harm because I really do have worries that um, if the, that this could actually be done badly, particularly in the private sector with people possibly, you know, lining their pockets without actually benefit to the population, particularly to women, you know, disenfranchised, disadvantaged who would actually need need this the most so anyway so that is my kind of like political speech trying to be trying to be a bit positive and i'm just going to ask you uh, uh, since i've got now uh, 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 i'm just going to ask you a question that you helped me answer that i've been asked a lot particularly following the, the this sort of very insightful question from from uh, one of the uh, colleagues from Ukraine who, who have been listening to you. What is your answer uh, uh, when when we are asked, why not just give aspirin to everybody, particularly primates? And you could argue progesterone for that matter as well. I think exactly there are two, two, two responses to that. The first one is that for many, many years, we have known that uh, folic acid which has apparently no side effects, is extremely beneficial in the prevention or major reduction in the risk of uh, neural tube defects. And people have argued for years that we should put folic acid in our bread so that the whole population is forced to, by default, to to take folic acid. Uh, I think it's about six or seven years ago, a paper with Brunswick as the first author from Nick Wald, who was one of the advocates of folic acid, that showed that in England at the moment, the uptake of folic acid is about 30%. So despite the fact that everybody knows that folic acid is good for you, that there are no side effects, that it's extremely cheap, only 30% of the population take folic acid. So one element, one answer is the compliance of the population to take a, a, a drug. Uh, whereas, theoretically at least, if you tell a woman that you have a specific risk for something, then you are more likely to take the drug. And I am one of those really bad people in terms of compliance, because I used to smoke a lot, I used to keep, keep having nasty chest infections, and then pneumonias. And I was taking antibiotics for two days, I knew they were always taking, t- telling me take them for seven days, but after two days when I was better, I, I just used to throw them away. So I understand what is poor uh, compliance. You are particularly bad. You I, am, I know, I know. The, the second argument, of course, is the, is the argument that, that of risks. Uh, as, as a trialist yourself, you know that we pretend that there are no risks from aspirin because in all of the trials with aspirin, there was no significant increase in the, in the adverse, uh, adverse events. But we are cheating, really because the adverse events are quite rare uh, individually, and none of the studies or all of the studies combined are not of sufficient power to to demonstrate that adverse events. In other studies, for example, in old men like me that take aspirin uh, routinely, we know that the risk of hemorrhagic events, serious hemorrhagic events leading to death from gastrointestinal bleeding or cerebral hemorrhage is three times higher than in people that do not uh, take aspirin. So even if the risk of an adverse event called abruption or severe postpartum hemorrhage uh, or even brain hemorrhage in the baby is one in in 5,000, because the rate of preterm preeclampsia that you're trying to prevent, especially for a white population, is only about 0.6%. Uh, percent, six in a thousand, then we may be reaching the point that if everybody was given aspirin, we may well be producing more harm than, than, than benefit. That's all. So it's compliance and actually don't underestimate the potential harm of, of aspirin. Perfect. And also with your randomized study published in the New England, 
that you found that if compliance of the use of aspirin was, what was it, less than 80%, then there were no significant benefits anymore. Correct. So something else that, something that has gone wrong with the way we present the results from, uh, from trials. I understand the logic of uh, analyzing data on the basis of the intention to treat. But if you, if you take a, ta a tablet and you throw it in the toilet, and that counts as if you had taken the tablet, of course, it, it screws up the results of your trial. And compliance somehow must be integrated into the, into the outcome measure. And in this trial, the, the compliance was, was very high. It was 90%. Kiprus, can I just ask you one other question that, that, that I want to hear your answer to? Um, as you know, uh, I had a bet with you and with, with Dave Wright, and I thought that never in a million years aspirin is going to be as positive as, as it is. And I hope neither did I, Jaffer, neither did I. Yeah. And I, uh, although you, I have to say that you were due for a positive trial after, after 66 negative RCTs. Um, I always wondered how come that, that the, the result is so striking. And my theory is that you have, through hard work and possibly a little bit of luck, with a combination of these factors, identify the population that is potentially particularly uh, beneficial of aspirin. So my question to you is, by po possibly manipulating or arguing that you could actually pick and choose PLGF or PAPE or uterine artery doppler, is it at least theoretically possible that you may lose some of the benefit of aspirin because you have identified particularly bad placenta that is aspirin sort of compliant or, or, or respond to aspirin and that you may lose that benefit by picking and choosing to manipulate your false positives and false negatives. That's an extremely good point. You're right. Um, because of the components of the screening, uh, it is possible that we were identifying through one of them, as you said correctly, PLGF, uh, the, sub, the, the group that would be particularly uh, susceptible to, to beneficial effects from aspirin. And if we were to drop that, maybe the, the, the performance of, treat, of, of, of treatment would be, would be less. You're, you're right. But you cannot, of course, answer that question, can you? Yeah. So one of the first conclusions, I think, from this debate is that we should ban all private uh, practice. So for the state of Ukraine and all, also other countries have no private practice anymore. And I'm sure that overall outcome would be much better than it is nowadays. I never said that. Uh, no, I said it. Uh, <laughs> Zarko, Zarko, you have these pre and birth clinics where people with uh, poor history come, etc. And that reminds me of cervical length screening, which is not very reliable in the hands of inexperienced doctors, etc. Should we centralize these aspects of screening? Or at the end, do you re are you really uh, uh, positive about the fact that at the end, all the doctors will be able to, to do it? Um, I don't. And that, is, that, is, that comes back to the, to the issue of, uh, that I've asked Kipros about. I am very, very comfortable with the concept of doing cervical length screening in a high risk population uh, because a there are very there are not that many that it is much easier to uh, to do the even the quality control at the unit unit level and frankly again uh, agreeing with, with keepers that if we do a mistake in terms of the way we manage either with pessary or progesterone or omega-3 or whatever it is confined to much smaller population and we can learn very quickly because outcomes are much more common. So I feel quite comfortable in actually uh, doing that in, in, in a high-risk population in the context of um, in these pre birth prevention clinics. I completely get the argument of why uh, uh, screening of general population that 
Roberto is, is, is talking about is, is so attractive. But following the logic of discussion that we had, you have to have some concerns about doing it at a large scale, particularly given that the false positive rate is going to be high. The question is who is going to pick up these women? Because whoever is going to, you know, this is not going to be extremely experienced ultrasonographers, right? So we can train them, but you have a, you have a, on Monday morning, somebody has identified in a, some sort of routine clinic, three women with a short service. They are beside themselves, right? They're crying. They've told them that they are, their baby is going to pop out within next week or so. They go on a website. So somebody needs to pick them up. Somebody needs to manage them. And this, this is my issue with, with, this is what I was trying to say to, uh, to Kipros is that uh, arguing, uh, providing evidence for screening, absolutely. But actually thinking through and impl implementing the screening programs, what do you do with screen positives? What do you do with screen negatives? How do you monitor com uh, and all the sort of things? This is not something that we, that, that we know how to do, and we just need to be honest about it, and we need to start talking. So, I guess what I'm tr this is my long answer to your short question to say we are not competent to, to, to actually think through all the possible implications of screening. There are people who do that much better, and we need to start talking, talking about it. I, I'm really worried that women with the low risk primates with a, with a short cervix she will be put on a bed rest, she will be put on antibiotics, and I've seen it. She'll be put on, on antibiotics, on bed rest, on a stitch, on all sorts of stuff. The doctors are not intelligent enough for the job they have. Kipro, should we cent centralize preeclampsia screening in London? You have 10 million inhabitants. Should all the hospitals do it, or should that be centralized to one or two, maybe? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, in the first phase of new heart transplant screening, in my uh, campaigning, I was saying it takes a few seconds for sonographers to be trained, and then everybody should be trained. And actually, every Saturday and Sunday, for many, many years, I used to go from hospital to hospital to, to train the local sonographers. It was part of my ideology that it could be done at local level. And then five years later, I became extremely undemocratic. And I said, everybody is completely incompetent. We must centralize uh, the, the, the service because, and, and this goes a long way towards Zarko, what Zarko was saying. It's not the measurement of nuclear translucency. It is the counseling of the people that you will give once you find that measurement. It is your ability to understand yourself um, what the combination of different factors are that would go into the development of a formula to give you a risk. It is the subsequent management of the patients. And it was my obsession at that time that created the Fetal Medicine Foundation. My fear uh, that when you measure the nuclear facility, one thing is to measure it wrongly. The second is if you find the measurement to be high, you could end up not putting the woman and the baby at risk, you could actually kill the baby because you will terrorize the woman that there is something seriously wrong and the baby will be killed. And that is why I embarked on the process of training, certification, giving software to people for free to make money, but forcing them to go through a process of certification. Zarko is absolutely right. I fully accept the argument of Roberto, and I have the same argument that in England, there is a zero chance that the creation of preterm clinics will reduce the rate of stillbirth. The only way in which we can do so is to have routine measurement of survival length of the whole population. It, it makes a lot of sense. However, Zarko is absolutely right. Who is going to create the infrastructure of making sure that we know how to measure the survival length? Well, you could argue that we had the same problem with the measurement of nuclear transmission and people eventually, when one day the national, the government said, 
you have to implement it. And they put David Wright to police it. And they created the structure so that in each hospital, there is one person responsible. And in each region, there's a pyramid of the steps that you need to take if the measurements are not right. The same structure can be implemented. But you're right. How are you going to interpret the results, even if you take them argue, uh, uh, accurately? And who is going to tell the patients what to do next? It is very likely that it will terrorize women, that their babies will be dead and severely handicapped. And then we will manipulate them, especially in the private sector, put them in bed, uh, kill them from deep vein thrombosis, um, disrupt the whole family, and then give them all sorts of different strange medications, and then eventually put in a stitch that ruptures the membranes and actually achieves what you wanted to prevent, to kill the baby. So these are very, very real things. So back to your question, Jerry, should we in London with a population of 10 million people and therefore 100,000 deliveries somehow centralize the measurement of cervical length? I, I don't think we can. It's the, it's the same really. Ukraine, I think, has a population of about 40 million, if I'm not right. Uh, and I suspect that Kiev may also have something like, I don't know, half a million to one, no. More. They also have 4 million, uh, 4 million people. 4 million people produce about 40,000 pregnancies in a year. Can you see all of these women ideally in one center? Yes. Will it happen? No chance. Just we, have to, we have to go out. We have to, we have to train people. But yes, there must be a system that controls what the high-risk group uh, has to be, how it, it is managed. In England, to a great extent, in, in, in the Netherlands, to some European countries, there is a strength in, 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 in our royal colleges where you, you, you implement certain uh, structures and certain uh, policies. In many countries, this does not exist. And that is where a benefit becomes a, a harm. I, I recognize what Jack was saying. And, and just to just to add, uh, uh, Jerry, for our colleagues in Ukraine, to see how real it is this concept of screening that we are talking about. You know, there are a lot of bad things about NHS and, and UK, but certainly running screening programs when eventually it happens is uh, something that we should be proud of. I do fetal medicine for a living for 30 years, right? I consider myself to be a reasonably good scanner. And um, when a woman comes he to me and say, I want to have a combined screening, I am actually referring her, I have to re refer her to a certified sonographer for screening because I'm not certified and I'm not monitored because key process, I just, I just can't be bothered to do that. And therefore I'm not allowed, the lab is not really going to accept my nuclear translucency. And when I have research fellows and consultants coming for another country, they think that we are barking mad. That how is it possible that, you know, and actually then when sonographer picks something up, she was going to refer the woman back to me. This is how serious and how obsessive we are about the screening. But unless you are serious and obsessive about screening, we come back to that, you can cause more harm than good. I agree. So we can do much better than we do, but it's difficult. It's very difficult. You need a system in your country for a backup. And even the referral doesn't always help. That reminds me of the uh, early fetal growth restriction in the United States. We found in Europe that the optimal timing of delivery of the early growth restricted fetus is by uh, measuring the ductus venosus uh, blood flow profiles and using a computerized fetal heart rate pattern that works in Europe, very low incidence of complication, high survival rate. And what do the U.S. centers for level three and level four care say? Well, it's too difficult to measure the ductus venosus. Here we talk about high care centers and even they don't bother. And that comes back to the laziness. We are not used to it. This was invented not in the United States, but this was invented wherever it was in the U.K. or Germany or whatever. It is. So we don't do it. We continue to do the biophysical profile score because we know that. 
it is very difficult to change. And that is probably the, might be the conclusion from this whole stage. It is difficult, but we should be motivated and we should not go for less than optimal at the end. And it may take some time. I, I thought I was more optimistic on the implementation of preeclampsia screening than Kipros is because I thought it's so obvious that we can do it and we can see how much time it will cost. I guess time is about up. It's beautiful weather in Kiev, sunny, no clouds anymore. So please, you all may go outside. It's still raining in the Netherlands. And I am going this afternoon for a Zoom to Greece, but I also have to, to watch it from here. Unfortunately, not over there. And who knows, I might meet Kipros also in essence. I don't know. Thank you all very much for this discussion. I think it was a very good quality. Thanks a lot and see you hopefully soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.